Bruchem Aboim. Again, welcome to our home. Thank you for attending. Um, again, on my thoughts today. You know, after, after I finished my thoughts last week on appreciation, I had an afterthought regarding the lesson. I felt that there was still more that we can all glean from this touching story about Dr. Hanok Chaim Howie Leibowitz. Now, before I begin with what I feel will be a deeper lesson in the story, I thought that it may be necessary to first discuss some information that will help us to connect to a valuable lesson related to in this story. Now, first let me begin with a quick review for those who may not have read the story. I would suggest that if you find this introduction interesting, that you go back to the lecture on appreciation. And there you, you can listen to the whole story in detail. I believe that it would be well worth your time. So, so let me begin with a quick summary. Dr. Leibowitz is an Orthodox Jew. He studied at Eish Torah in Yerushalayim. There he mentored and was guided by Reb Noach Weinberg, who served as the head of the yeshiva. At the time of this story, at this, that this story occurred, he was serving as the senior resident in charge of the ER, the emergency room at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. He was alerted of a cold blue. Uh, a woman had suffered a serious heart attack in the cafeteria and was in a state of cardiac arrest. He ran to the scene, and when he arrived, the team of doctors that were present had, had all but given up on the patient, but Dr. Leibowitz would not. Her husband had been forced to exit the cafeteria, but he managed to look on helplessly through a glass wall just outside the room. He realized that it was only due to the perseverance and determination of Dr. Leibowitz that his wife's life was saved. Dr. Leibowitz visited Mrs. Kelly in her hospital room. When she realized that who he was, she expressed words of gratitude. Well, she expressed the words, thank you, Dr. Leibowitz over again and again. Her heartfelt response should make all of us pause and think of all those things in our lives that we all take for granted daily, especially as we witness the profound emotion that her words evoked from Dr. Leibowitz as he expressed his thoughts after he left Mrs. Kelly's hospital room. You know, we are told by our sages that when God Almighty gave the children of Israel the Torah on Mount Sinai. He was portrayed in different roles. One of those roles was as a parent relating to their child, as when God Almighty expresses the children of Israel in the second, pardon me, addresses the children of Israel in the second book of the Torah, in the portion of the Exodus. There he says, B'ni B'chori Yisro, my firstborn child, Yisro. Our sages also interpret the verse in the book of Exodus in the portion of Yisro, which dates in reference to the giving of the Torah. By Yerid Hashem al Har Sinai, and God Almighty descended upon the mountain of Sinai. Rashi, commenting on a previous verse, stated that this teaches us that at the giving of the Torah, the divinity of God went out to meet them, the children of Israel, much like a bridegroom who eagerly steps forward to greet his beloved bride. We are also told by our sages in the Talmud and the tractate of Brachot based on the verse in the Torah and the portion of Ayera, where it states, HaKol Bidei Shemayim Chutz Miyirat Shemayim, that everything, everything is in the hands of heaven except for the fear of heaven. From these words, of Hanina expressed his opinion in the Talmud that man has free will to choose whether to serve God or not. Now, I interpret these words from a, a totally different perspective. I view God Almighty as a benevolent Father in Heaven. So when I hear the word fear used in reference to God, my Father in Heaven, I find it troubling. Is there any son who would stand by silently when someone denigrates the character of his father? Or, or is there any father who would like to believe that his children fear him, love and respect are appreciated with fear? I think not. So the Hebrew words, Yirat Shemayim, the fear of heaven, I believe are stated in reference to God Almighty and his concern for us, his children. Just like any loving father, think of how concerned we as parents are as we watch our children as they stumble their way through life. 
we know what they should do. But we are all too many times forced to watch helplessly as they make the wrong decisions in their lives. This, I believe, is what is meant by Yirat Hashem, fear of heaven. That is stated in connection with God Almighty, our loving Father, and His fear, His concern for us, His wayward children. I realize that I have introduced many different concepts, but all of this information is important for us to appreciate the lesson that we can learn from this story. Now, imagine God in His role as our husband. Then imagine that His wife, the children of Israel, have succumbed to a severe spiritual heart attack. They are suffering from a deep and troubling question, or even worse, a total disregard for any connection to spirituality. They are currently in a state of spiritual cardiac arrest. And imagine that God Almighty, our husband, is, so to speak, standing behind a glass wall, a place where he can only observe all that is happening to his beloved wife, the children of Israel. God looks on with trepidation as the doctors are trying to save her life. They have tried again and again, but they have given up. There is no sign of life. There is no longer any hope of recovery. So too it would seem that the children of Israel today are in a state of cardiac arrest, not physically, but spiritually. But we are fortunate to have been blessed with leaders such as the Lubavitcher Rebbe of blessed memory, from Menachem Menel Schneerson, who has sent his emissaries as shluchim throughout the world to try to resuscitate as many Jewish souls as possible. The Rebbe's mitzvah campaigns even included bringing an awareness to non-Jews concerning their connection to the seven Noahide laws and their obligation to adhere to them. But as good and as dedicated as these shluchim, the emissaries are, they are understandably, they understandably feel that they can't save everyone and they say, I'm afraid that she's gone and there's no longer any sign of spiritual life. And then they leave. God watches the whole scenario through the glass wall. And as you can imagine, his Yira Shemaya, he is devastated. It seems that he has lost his beloved wife. But then Dr. Leibowitz appears and he says, well, let me try one more time once, twice, again and again. But he too fails. There is no heartbeat. There is no interest left whatsoever. The other spiritual doctors walk away and they say, there's no hope. But Dr. Leibowitz hmm, does not accept that. In his heart he knows that for those who believe there is always hope. And he applies his spiritual defibrillator a fourth and then a fifth time. But still, the monitor is silent, but he won't give up, and he tries a sixth time, and then a thin line appears on the heart monitor. We have life. There's still hope. Can you imagine the joy and happiness that God, the husband of the children of Israel, feels when he witnesses leaders in our generation like the Rebbe and his shluchim, in conjunction with all the other outreach programs that exist throughout the world today? They are saving the souls of thousands of our brethren. But then there are those spiritual doctors like Dr. Leibowitz who save one person, one soul at a time. Those souls that everyone else who have tried have given up on. But those special doctors of God know just like Dr. Leibowitz that we do not have the permission to give up on any soul in this world. In fact, in Judaism, we even pray for the souls of our deceased relatives and friends. If we can divorce ourselves from God, then He would be free to divorce Himself from us. We can only imagine how grateful God Almighty is when you are responsible for saving the life of one of His most precious family members. Your name will constantly be on His lips. If you think deeper into the story, one recognizes the difference between the deep words of appreciation expressed by Mrs. Kelly and Dr. Leibowitz. Without a doubt, Mrs. Kelly's words originated from the depths of her heart. They were moving. She thanked Dr. Leibowitz again and again. If someone were reading or listening to this story for the first time, well, they may, may well get a bit choked up. They may even shed a tear. 
At first glance, Dr. Liebus's words may not have appeared to have been quite as touching as were those of Mrs. Kelly, they, though they both followed her narrative. Both presented four different scenarios. In each scenario, they expressed just how grateful they truly were. She began her words with her seeing her children again, as did he. After which she sincerely thanked Dr. Leibowitz for saving her life, repeating the same words after each scenario that she envisioned. Thank you, Dr. Leibowitz. He began his words of gratitude directed to Hashem, God Almighty, our benevolent Father in Heaven. He said, Thank you, Hashem. Then in his second and third scenarios that he imagined, he thanked his teacher and mentor, Thank you, Rav Noah Weinberg. And in his final scenario, he again thanks God Almighty. Thank you, Hashem, for all of your many blessings. Though Mrs. Kelly's response was beautiful, she was, th she was thanking the messenger. She forgot to include the benefactor. Yes, we are all obligated to show our appreciation to those who have become instruments of God's merciful hand. We should always remember that everything, everything in this world is in the hands of God Almighty. There are times that a doctor may say to their patient, you know, we've done all that we can do. I'm afraid that now is in the, it is in the hands of God. Well, guess what? It was always in the hands of God. A doctor is only a messenger of God Almighty. As Socrates was quoted as saying, a doctor keeps a patient company while God Almighty performs his miracles. Dr. Leibowitz directed his opening and closing words of gratitude to his benefactor, God Almighty, with the words, Thank you, Hashem. But at the same time, he did not fail to acknowledge all that he owed to his teacher and mentor. Thank you, Rav Noah Weinberg. We need to know with complete certainty that we are all, as the Holy Baal Shem Tov stated, more beloved to God than a woman who has been barren. And then in her later years, she becomes pregnant and gives birth to a beautiful and healthy son. One can only imagine how much love she would feel towards her beloved child. Well, God Almighty loves each and every one of us even more. You know, think of the children of Israel as a thousand-piece jigsaw puzzle. If one piece is missing or broken off, the whole puzzle is useless. All you can do is throw it away. So to each and every Jewish soul counts. None, none can be discarded. There are no duplicates. As Hillel states in Pirkei Avot, the ethics of the fathers, Im ein ani li, me li. If I am not for myself, then who will be for me? Each of us were created unique with our own special mission, one that no one else can complete. In fact, that was the reason that God Almighty argued with Moshe at the burning bush for seven days to accept his unique mission to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt. That was the main purpose of his being created. Now, all of this should give us a deeper perspective on how precious each and every one of us is in the eyes of God our Father in Heaven. So whenever we are confronted with an opportunity to help another human being physically or spiritually, we should picture in our minds that God, our Father in Heaven, is looking at us through a glass wall. And imagine how grateful He will be to know that you saved His wife or His son or any member of His family from a state of spiritual cardiac arrest. But God's greatest joy would have to be when he watches us try again and again and truly exert all of our energies to revive the patient, to restart the spiritual heart that resides deep within the recesses of our minds, to jumpstart a spiritual heartbeat. We all have challenges, but we do not have permission to ever give up. We need to apply the spiritual defibrillator again and again. And who knows, if we take just one more try, that we may awaken the true and loving relationship that always exists in our hearts with our Father in Heaven. And with that, let us help to usher in the coming of Mashiach Sakana quickly and in our time. Again, let me thank you for attending. Again, God should bless you and yours with only good. And let me thank you again.
and wish you a good Shabbos. Uh, in a few minutes, again, a minute or so, we'll also start the second part of our series here, again, the musical part, and again, it'll be some original song that I wrote. Again, thank you so very much, and Shabbat Shalom.